What details does Mark give us about the resurrection of Jesus? That's what we're going to find out in Mark 16. All right, so Jesus has been put to death, but now we want to know what happens next. And we'll talk about the two different endings to Mark. Now, Sabbath has passed. Mary Magdalene, Salome, who's the mother of John and James, the sons of thunder, go to anoint him because it couldn't happen because of the time crunch with Sabbath. We had to get him into the tomb before the sun went down. They start out very early on the first day of the week. So when the sun rose, they went to the tomb and they were saying, well, which one of us is going to roll away that big, heavy stone? You know, (laughs) it is big. And they didn't really have a plan for that. And when they looked up at where he was buried, the stone was already rolled away. It was very large, it says. And so they walked into the tomb because who just opened this up? Who could just open it up? We'll find out in other chapters, it was also sealed, which means it had measures in place so that it wouldn't be opened. And so they saw someone sitting there, a young man sitting there, and it says, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. ZSV, by the way. And so they look around. Sometimes this is mentioned as the angel of the Lord. Is that Jesus himself? And they don't recognize him? Or The other rumors that were there is that, one, it wasn't Jesus that was crucified. It was somebody else that looked a lot like Jesus, and so he wasn't crucified. But right now, this young man is confirming Jesus was crucified. Other people said, well, he didn't die. He just sort of fainted, didn't really die of the crucifixion, and so he they snuck him off because he was still living. We know the truth now. Jesus was the person who was crucified, and not only that, he was crucified to his death. But then tells him, go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there, just as he told you. Jesus did say that, that he was going to go there. They went out of the tomb and fled because they were scared and astonished, it said. I think it means like stunned. They just couldn't do anything. And they didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid. Clearly, we know that they told Peter and the other apostles and disciples this. So we say, well, is that a contradiction? They didn't say anything. They just ran off, just like the sheep ran off in the first place. Of course, they told Peter and they told the disciples because we know that from other gospels, but they didn't go around like what might be you and I would do. Like if we saw something miraculous, we'd run through the streets going, hey, everyone, Jesus is risen. Everyone, hey, you know, we would start yelling it and screaming it to everyone. Instead, they ran off probably to go see Peter. And they didn't say anything to anyone. They were in a flat out run. And so it begs the question too, where were the disciples? It was only the women. You know, it's so funny how women were just discounted in this era. And these were the ones who did the bold actions, who called Jesus for who he was, who did the washing and the anointing of the perfume on Jesus. And now watch the crucifixion but then went to the tomb the next day, put their lives on the line because maybe there were going to be Roman guards there. Who knows what they were going to find when they went there? It was the women who always stuck with him. And that leads me to think that it's a testament to how true the gospel is. My dad's opinion was the gospels, again, were written to make the apostles look good. We hung out with the Lord. Look how cool we were. We don't get any of that in the New Testament. But not only that, They weren't here. The very low levels of society, being the women who couldn't inherit, who would have nothing if they got divorced, who had no social or legal standing in this society, were the ones who testified to Jesus, the ones who called him the Messiah, the ones who watched his crucifixion, and the ones who went to him very next day, early in the morning. If you were writing this as a propaganda piece, you would have pick somebody else. It's also interesting to mention that most of these women were not mentioned in Mark before. So these were the first times we've heard the name, but they would have been able to know who these people were, probably because they, again, lived around the areas. And so we don't have to necessarily identify them in the same way, because I think it would have been known who they were. Someone else pointed out, too, there was no great celebration here. There wasn't a big group of apostles waiting to greet Jesus at his tomb. 
He told us he was going to do the son of Jonah. He was going to die and be gone for three days and come back. Nothing, right? Shouldn't they have heard all those words he was saying? Instead, they scattered. There's nothing here rejoiceful about it, even though now we rejoice knowing that Jesus has come back to save us and his mission has been completed. And so that would have ended Mark in most of the texts that they had. Would they say that, you know, the most of the pieces of paper that they had ended Mark there? It didn't show what happens next. It doesn't talk about what happens when the apostles meet him in Galilee. And now some of the other manuscripts had Mark 16 through 20. And some people say, was this the lost chapters of Mark and ending it? And they found it someplace else and tacked it on so that it would make Mark whole? Was it that they worried the story didn't end and so they wanted to put an ending on it and so they created an ending from the other Gospels? We don't know exactly what happened, whether or not this is Mark's writing, whether this is an add-on from it, but the rest of Mark appears that it says Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and that's who he first appeared and that's who he cast the demons out of and she went and told the other apostles of people who it says who were with him because they were mourning and weeping because they lost Jesus. And when they heard Jesus was alive, they would not believe it. Then it says Jesus appeared to two of the apostles in another farm. They were walking in the countryside and he appeared to them. We're going to hear more about that story later. And then they, they went back and told the rest of them. And then he gives them the great commission. And so then Jesus meets with the rest of the 11. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. We heard that Jesus said that before. Matthew was a little bit more kind in it, but Mark said that they were hard of hearts because they didn't believe who they saw after he was raised. He told them he was going to be raised. How many times? And then he says, quote, in ESV, go into the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news. Again, the Romans would have understood the good news, good tidings to the whole creation, everybody, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned, doesn't say, and not baptized. Obviously, the belief is the important part here. And it says, these signs will accompany those who believe in my name, and they will cast out demons, speak in new tongues, they will pick up servants with their hands, and they will drink deadly poisons, and it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. This is a message that he's going to talk about Acts, his apostles, what they're going to do after this point. And so after Jesus spoke to them, he was taken up into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while Jesus worked in them and gave them those accompany signs. So that's the part, like I said, that people don't know if that got added on or not to end the story of Mark? Did Mark mean to have a great cliffhanger to say, okay, the centurion said it was the Messiah. The women saw him raised from the dead. They're going to meet him in Jerusalem and just ended it there. Or was it actually continued on in this last chapter? It talks a little bit about all of the oldest parts of the Bible. And so some of these that are the oldest scriptures we have today from 325 and 340 don't contain this. And they said, and neither are about a hundred other scripture pieces that were translated into other languages don't include this Mark 9 through 20. According to the writings in the Greek, Eusebius and Jerome did not have these verses and they were the early church fathers. And so there were some other manuscripts that did have this writing. So there were many others that did. And about one third, it says, of the vocabulary is different than the rest of Mark. So they, that's why they believe that this was probably tacked on at the end to give it a little bit of a better ending so people knew what it was about. But it was also passages that were well known, that were written in various places. So Justin Martyr wrote it in his writing, Apology. Papias, which was one of the church fathers around 100 AD, refers to Mark 16, 18. So there's all sorts of places. So we can go back and forth. There's nothing in the very end of Mark that goes against any of the other gospels. So it's not that we believe it's not true. We just don't know if it was part of the original story. 
All right. So now we've reached the end of Mark and we're going to continue on next week with Luke. And so my meditation is going to be on the resurrection of Jesus. In the time that I'm reading this, we are very close to just after Easter and thinking about what a monumental thing it is to have Jesus resurrected. He told people it was going to happen. He said he was going to rise from the dead. He said it was going to be after three days. And despite the fact he told people it was going to happen, even the Sadducees understood that's what he was saying. He is now saying, this has happened. The person you seek has risen. He is not here. Boy, I got to think about that for a while. The prayer I have for myself is that I'm not alarmed. I think there's so many times we see things in the world and what's going on, and then we get alarmed. I get alarmed myself. And Jesus says, don't be. The worst thing that could possibly happen in their eyes just happened. And he says, don't be alarmed. We also should think about that more. And the thing that I'm going to share with other people is the fact that Jesus is risen, that he came back just like he said he was going to, just like he told everyone he was going to. And the stone that was rolled away, it wasn't to let Jesus out. It was to let the women in so they could see what happened. And we too should be witnesses to the risen Lord. Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. We will continue on with Luke next time and start that off. We have now covered two of the Gospels and we have two more. And you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm happy to hear what you have to say. And if you have anything I could pray for you about. Thank you so much for listening. <music>